As your cousin, I know you come from a family with strong environmental ethic. Your dad is an outdoorsman, hunting, fishing, skiing, mountain climbing, and a, I know from spending a lot of time with him during college, uh, he was always there whenever I came home from Madison. He was a vocal advocate for wildlife and habitat conservation. While your mom was a great communicator and humanitarian, in media with her own TV show, then serving several years overseas in the Peace Corps during her retirement years. So I imagine you may have started off in a directional life that brought you to the kind of cutting edge work like you did in the Cove, or, or where the connections you made in your adult life, what led you to this kind of work that took it to this level. It's a great question. Um, I think the roots of my understanding uh, philosophically of uh, how important our, our environment is to us and being a caretaker thereof comes from my familial uh, relationships, whether it be my parents um, or some other people in our extended family who offered me the opportunity to have things like the, you know, the cabin up in the Northwoods here in Wisconsin and other places that I have in Minnesota. I feel very fortunate to have grown up in an environment where my mother's side of the family was <coughs> in Minneapolis and St. Paul and the Twin Cities, and my father's side was a little more rural. Um, so I had those, both the combination of both of those things sort of led to an understanding of a world that was a dynamic place. Um, I went to college at the University of Colorado in Boulder, which is a bastion of environmentalism and consciously driven thought, amongst other things. Um, over the years, there have been all kinds of movements and, and uh, voices of the people that have not necessarily started there, but certainly found a home there. Uh, so it was a logical progression for me um, in terms of my understanding of, of you know, what I was looking for as a path um, sort of presented itself early, and I, and I, I found myself following it. Uh, you know, the, uh, growing up with a family that hunts and fishes and, and does the things that you described brought me to an early understanding of, of how the ecosystems all function together and, and uh, my part in it. Um, later in life, you know, I put, I, the last time I was hunting, I was 16 years old. Um, I haven't done anything like that uh, aside from maybe a catch and release occasionally uh, um, on a fishing expedition with some friends. Uh, so. The change from consumption to um, more of a participatory observer is something that I learned about along my own path. Uh, but it was all of those things combined that brought me to a community in Colorado that was not only creative, um, but environmentally minded. And I was very lucky to be invited by some good friends to participate in the production of the code. Well, you know, you may be the most, you know, at least one of the most compelling personalities and communicators in our extended family. So I couldn't help but notice in the Cove that although you appeared in most of those compelling scenes, uh, you rarely, if ever, were prominently featured or recorded speaking that I recall. Um, was that by chance or by your preference, request, was because of a certain role you played in the plan or by some other design of the production or editing process? Uh, that's a, that's a big question. <coughs> uh, it was never our intention. Uh, a lot of people don't know this about the code. The code was not, was not, when we filmed the code, it was never our intention to be in front of the camera. We were telling a story about other people and their activism and their environmental ethos that was hopefully a voice to make a change in the world that was a necessary, yeah, let me say this, um, we identified people that were making a change in the world, and the idea behind the Oceanic Preservation Society, which is the organization that produced the code, was to highlight the good, the bad, and the ugly of things that were happening with our oceans on a planetary scale. <coughs> we met Rick O'Berry, who is the central protagonist in the film, uh, along the way, and then everything changed, and the scope of the film and the focus went to his story and that of the situation with the dolphins in Taiji and the captive dolphin industry around the world. Um, along the way, we shot what uh, we thought all along was going to be B-roll, which is the part that fills in between in any movie that you see. And 
So my role specifically as the production manager of the film is not one that's in front of the camera, rarely. Um, we had a very small team of people. We never had more than six people in the field working on the film. We were all first-time filmmakers. So as we made the film, our roles and our responsibilities was a constant evolution. We really all did everything. I learned how to shoot. I learned how to do sound. I learned how to do a lot of things in the production side of the film that were unfamiliar with me, <coughs> excuse me, to me when I started. But uh, by the end of the four-year experience was something that, you know, I would never call myself a cameraman or a sound engineer, but I can do, as can all of my colleagues. Um, <coughs> the, my role specifically was a behind-the-scenes role. I was there to support the artists and the ingenious people that were creating the film by providing them with the tools that they needed so that when they showed up on set, or on location, all they had to do was really go into motion to do what it was to capture the images we were looking for that day. Sometimes it was a little more dodgy than other days. You know, it was covert operations that happened here and there that we had to, you know, surreptitiously find our way into places, although no laws were ever broken in the making of the cove and no one was hurt anywhere along the way. Uh, so it was an evolution for all of us. and. Um, there's an interview in the film for a moment, mm -hmm. but what I'm there for is to support the other people, and so I was happy to be in the background. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, we have uh, you know, such a big extended family um, with everyone dispersed to the winds throughout the country, so it's been years since we've had a good conversation, you and I. Um, catch me up in relation to this big life event you experienced. What what has been your path since the filming of the Cove and its Academy Award win? Did did the experience enrich or disrupt your life in any way? Did it lead you to greater opportunities or challenges? Are you still working on the issue, or have you moved on to other environmental issues, or shifted to some other life priorities? Hmm. My experience since the Cove has been incredibly rewarding on many levels. Um, I can't express the latitude with which it's, it's affected my life because, you know, on any given day, it's 2014, this is six year, five years after we initially released the film at Sundance. <coughs> we expected to screen the film at Sundance and go home with a pat on the back and a good Anya kind of thing, and we ended up winning the Audience Award there, which opened the door to the next year, you know, subsequently 70 some odd awards around the world later, culminating in an Oscar, as you mentioned, is something that none of us ever expected. The film took on a life of its own through the story that we were able to tell. Uh, and in that, it changed all of our lives. At the end of the day, the, to answer your question, my life is never the same since making that movie. It, at its very core, there is a quote from Margaret Mead that says, uh, to paraphrase, uh, the actions of a small group of people are the ones that will ultimately be those that change the world. And if there is ever a group of people that unexpectedly found themselves in that position, it was myself and my colleagues making the call. I am stopped on the street on occasion when I visit places that I've been before or spoken or go back home to Colorado where I used to live for many years, uh, oftentimes. Not often, but on occasion I'm stopped by people that recognize me from the film or as a part of their community and do something as simple as buy me a cup of coffee or introduce me to their kid, you know, and say, you know, this is what can happen if you follow the right path, you know. Um, coming out of that experience, <coughs> when I say this is what can happen, what I mean by that is, you know, a small group of people can really make a big difference. Uh, coming out of that experience, I was very fortunate to continue on the path of environmentalism. I've worked with some amazing organizations in the years since, including the Sea Shepherd Conservation Society, Greenpeace, Surfers for Cetaceans, um, Save the Waves, a number of mostly ocean-minded environmental organizations is where my focus has been. Um, oftentimes people ask, you know, how come you're not out saving the black rhino or elephants or something like that. And the answer to that is that, you know, environmentalism needs to be a focused effort. And if you're interested in looking out for the, you know, 
old growth forest in your own backyard. Um, that's what you need to focus your attention on. And so my passion and my love is after a lifetime of living both in the mountains and in ocean-minded environments, including the Caribbean and now in California, I focus my energies there. Uh, I continue to speak fairly regularly. Um, I started a nonprofit in the wake of my experience that focuses on um, bringing the message of environmentalism and activism to students from grade school all the way through university level. So um, I have been very fortunate in being invited to speak on campuses around the country, uh, across the country and around the world in the last couple of years. Um, it doesn't happen as much anymore because the, the resonance of the code is something that is now sort of in the rear view mirror for a lot of people, but the folks that the Oceanic Preservation Society presently is, there will be a film released uh, hopefully at Sundance in January, which is their next film, and so we will return to hopefully a place where people will offer us the opportunity to speak to these issues. Um, I think that's half of your question. Mm -hmm. <coughs> the other part regarding uh, myself, what I do now, I continue to work in event, film, and uh, music production. So I find myself out there in the world actively um, participating in events that attract big crowds, whether it be for um, music festivals and concerts, or I work specifically with a wonderful company called Wonderlust that does a yoga and music tour across the country that brings a message of consciously minded living that includes environmentalism as one of the, the um, points that they try to bring to people's awareness as to living a well-balanced and well-rounded life that includes an awareness of the environment you live in and how you impact it. And so, you know, uh, <coughs> I've always been relatively environmentally minded, but like yourself now, you know, I travel with a recyclable water bottle and I use a recyclable, co a reusable coffee cup everywhere I go and I give them away as gifts to people when I see them come to work each day with the something that ends up in the trash or the recycling. Chances are if I work for you within more than a couple of days on set or on location, I will show up to give you a coffee cup with my own, you know, sticker on it for Save the Waves or something like that. It's a reminder that people just simply, you know, by doing simple acts like that, I find that you're not lecturing or teaching people anything more than an opportunity to be less consumptive. And if there's one way that my life has become a smaller footprint, it's that. I have, the, I'm aware of my consumerism. I'm aware of how I participate in the world and what I leave behind. And um, I think if there's one way that people can make a difference in their immediate environment, it's that, you know. Figure out how to recycle in your own community. Figure out how to use the resources that you have in ways that are responsible, like, you know, your water consumption in your own home. Um, all of the things that young people now, as I speak to students specifically, it's a part of their everyday environment. They are aware of what recycling is. They are aware of water consumption and, and what it means in a community, for instance, in the state of California where I live now, where every day you have to be aware. Um, it helps them <coughs> by empowering and giving the tools of understanding to young people. They can go home and empower their families and their parents and their peer groups to do the same. Whereas even in this house where we're sitting right now doing this, you know, a few years ago, the idea of recycling and water consumption is something that no one thought about. And now on the front porch of the house is a recycling bin, you know, and so we can make a change from within and educate the people around us. And for me, um, although I'm not out in the world as a, you know, active proponent of it every day and, and in a place where I have an audience that I was fortunate to get for one, one, one time, um, you know, my bicycle and my reusable coffee cup speak for themselves. Mm -hmm. nice. Well, um, I think there'll be a lot of people watching this interview who are really interested in the dolphins and have a heart connection to them and understand that they may be more intelligent and sentient than our science is even coming close to understanding. Um, and that infamous annual event is in Taiji is, is coming up again. And, and uh, so I wanted to know, as one of those people who think the dolphins are completely misunderstood and, and, and 
science will understand uh, someday their language, their uh, intelligence. Um, you know, your your work is very personal to me, and I've never told you that because we haven't spent much time together as our busy adult lives have gotten underway. Um, and so it's also, it's, uh, I guess I, I just want to know, you know, can you give me any guess as to if and when this primitive slaughter ritual will end? Uh, will it be when cultural beliefs are finally, you know, able to change? Or will it be when the economics become unprofitable? Or, you know, has there been some progress? Mm. Regarding the change in what's happening specifically in Taiji with the dolphin hunt and other places in the world, uh, it's a slow process. It has not stopped. It is ongoing. The hunt started in September. It goes through March in Japan every year. Um, there is less and less participation on an international scale and more and more activism around these events. The awareness that the Cove has brought rise on the shoulders of many activists before us. Rico Berry was there, a gentleman named Hardy Jones was there, who was behind an organization called Blue Voice. <coughs> the Sea Shepherd Conservation Society was there before us. So make no mistake, this is an ongoing process that um, many dedicated people have been involved in for many years before we arrived. We were very fortunate to be well funded by the Oceanic Preservation Society to be able to use our resources to take <coughs> the work of all of these people and bring it to a place where it was more <coughs> presentable to the masses. Uh, change in Japan, like many places, has to come from within. There is a slaughter of, of pilot whales that happens in the Faroe Islands, uh, which is an entirely different thing that happens for no good reason either. Um, I won't go too far into my own personal politics. I think that the film speaks for itself. What we tried to do with the movie was present a position that is obviously biased on behalf of the animals and our planet, but isn't too... Uh, we try not to come down too hard on the, on the shoulders of the Japanese fishermen that, to a degree, have been doing this for generations. Now, oh, 400 years ago, whaling was popular and regular in their culture, it disappeared until post-World War II. The harvesting of whales and dolphins, specifically in Japan, is actually something that is a result of the lack of foodstuffs. After World War II, the U.S. Navy, led by MacArthur and a number of other people, returned to Japan, helped them to convert what was left of their Navy into whaling ships so that they could feed the people of Japan. So the whole idea that this is something that's been going on for hundreds of years and there's this cultural phenomenon that we have no right to speak to is actually misleading at best. Uh, that being said, um, being that I am a white American coming into another country speaking to them about what they should or should not be doing comes off as what's been called cultural imperialism, which, to be honest, I can identify with. I mean, who's interested in listening to some white boy from Minnesota talk about saving the animals when Americans in general are portrayed across the planet as being fairly warmongering? You know, at the present moment, we're not in too many conflicts, but when the film came out, we were in Afghanistan and Iraq and any number of other places that I've talked about a whole lot. So there's a certain level of hypocrisy that existed. So to get past all of that and get back to the environmentalism of it is what our focus has always been. Um, teaching the young people, again, back to what I was mentioning before, is this is an issue that will change with time. The Japanese culture is one that is very rooted in tradition and respect of your elders and of your elders' tradition. Um, so, changing policy about how people think about using the resources in the ocean is something that will take potentially an entire generation to have real change affected. Um, this is an island nation that depends on the ocean for so many of its resources and has always. So, it's an innate part of their culture. Um, harvesting these animals 
is, as we demonstrated in the film, and I won't go too far down that road because I invite you all to watch the film, uh, but it speaks to an economic boon rather than anything else. This is about a small number of people making money. So the harvest goes on, the hunt continues. There are people on the ground every day from the Sea Shepherd organization. They're called the Cove Guardians. They come from all around the world and, and give their time to be there to document what's happening and to get it out to the world through the channels that they have, which is various places on the internet and, and newsletters and things of that nature. Um, I myself continue to work with those organizations when I can and when I'm invited. Um, as I said, I started a nonprofit of my own that is somewhat on the back burner for me, but will never go away. You know, this is where my heart is and, and where I speak to as an adult in the world who can perhaps make a difference with the voice that I have. And so, at the end of the day, that's my message to anyone who sees something in their community that they believe can be changed or, or should be, is to pick up a camera. You know, Nine out of ten people have a phone in their pocket that can capture the images of toxic, you know, somebody in your neighborhood is dumping something down the drain that drains to water, you know. Their, the gas station on the corner is improperly disposing of the oil that they take out of cars when they do oil changes. The guys who run the restaurant on the corner are disposing of their grease wrong. People are dropping their cigarette butts in the gutter. You know, any number of things that are happening in your community, you can document and, you know, put out there on YouTube, make yourself a Twitter campaign, use a Kickstarter. There are so many ways to engage your community, and it starts with the motion and putting yourself in motion. So I would that's where I find myself today, is using my own voice to encourage others. Um, I think this next question will be a hard thing to explain when you're, you're in the middle of your life's work, uh, but uh, if you wanted to relate a message to your extended family in relation to this work you do, or try to convey a legacy of hope to inspire all of us, any of us who are watching this to follow, what would you say? Would it, would it even be about environmental causes or one's life work or our personal issues like health and happiness uh, more important for us to keep as priorities in life? Because it's hard for those of us who are involved in these things to keep that kind of balance and perspective. I mean, is there one more important than another? Is it healthy to do this personally? Regarding that's an interesting question. So the question is, how do I keep a balance of all the things that I think are important, both personally, environmentally, politically, my own motivation in the world, and how I keep that balance? For me, if I wasn't in a place to be able to use the voice that I've found, I think that I would uh, be less of a, of a man. I think I would, the opportunities that you have to change the world around you are ones that are often lost on people that believe that they have to participate in the status quo. They need to have a white picket fence around their 2.5 bedroom house with three and a half bathrooms or whatever it is that you feel as though is the norm to keep up with the Joneses. And that's something that personally for me has um, gone away from being important. Um, my role in my community is something that is more important to me. And when I say community, I mean my global community. Making a difference in the small ways that I can to create a place that's a more inhabitable backyard, uh, that's a more hospitable environment for conversation and development of ideas that lead towards something that go away from the norms that we are all told are what should be. Um, I think that if you step away from things like uh, mainstream media to get your news from is a healthy alternative. I'm not suggesting you turn off your TV, but I'm suggesting that you pick up something other than those that are available when you hit your room. I think that good conversation at the coffee shop on the corner with not only your peers, but maybe those that are a little bit older than you, and bringing in the younger generations in the conversation 
brings perspectives that are valuable from a variety of, of directions that ultimately help us all to see what could be a better path. Um, I'm fortunate in that uh, I'm single, I have, uh, I'm self-employed, uh, and when I say fortunate, I mean that in that I, I'm lucky to have that, but it's, an, it's a world that I created. I decided long ago um, not to step into some corporate structure, not to go to work for someone who demands that I be there from 8 to 5 or whatever hours it is. Now, I'm not suggesting that that's not something that's necessary for everyone in the world. Everybody's got to have a job. We all need to take care of our own. But when you leave that place, I encourage, m my hope for the, the people that I love and those around me is that they find themselves back in the things that they're passionate about, whether it be writing, dancing, yoga, environmentalism, activism in whatever way it is that can make an impact, um, because that leads to a well-balanced existence for me. Um, I used to charge ahead pretty hard in life, um, thinking that I had something to prove a lot of the time and a message to deliver and if there's one thing I really learned in the production of The Cove and in the, the post uh, and bringing the film to an audience around the world it's that a good conversation leads to an, a thoughtful opportunity for everyone that's involved rather than some sort of dogmatic lecture because people leave not interested in being lectured to they're interested in being invited rather than. And so that's the path I try and walk. Well, it's um, got to be hard kind of mixing some of these family questions with uh, your personal and life work, uh, especially when that work's so public. So I just want to thank you again for being willing to consider these questions and letting us post the transcript on our Wolf College blog site. Um, not being a professional interviewer, uh, I probably missed some basic questions that you found people really always want to know. I want to know if there's any other curiosities you think our readers or viewers might really want to know about the Cove or the Dolphins or your work or your life. As far as resources go for your students and or folks that might watch this or, or read the transcript, uh, specific to the dolphins and what's happening in Taiji, Japan, you can go to the Oceanic Preservation Society website, which is opsociety.org. You can find out about their ongoing workshops and programs that they have to involve people in what's happening there to bring a voice to what's happening to the animals. And you can also find out about their new film that's coming out soon, which is called Racing Ex Extinction. And it's about the extinction crisis that we are actually living through right now and is being caused by humans' interaction with the environment around us. A lot of people don't know about that. So I'll leave it at that. The, the Oceanic Preservation Society presents a, a compelling story that will soon be in theaters around the world. Um, as far as uh, what's happening in Taiji specifically, Rick O'Berry has a project called the Dolphin Project, which you can also look up online. I believe it's the dolphinproject.org. Um, and there is an, the Sea Shepherd Conservation Society is an organization that's often described um, in many ways that are sometimes you know, pirate activists, eco-terrorists, things of that nature. Um, it's an unfortunate label that they get, but what they do is they actually put themselves on the ground in places and participate in a physical way that stops people from doing things um, that are detrimental to our environment. So I would invite anyone who wants to get involved um, in more than just signing a petition uh, sort of capacity, which is oftentimes what people can do. Um, and that's a beautiful thing in and of itself. But uh, check out the Sea Shepherd Conservation Society. It's seashepherd.org. Um, also, there's a wonderful group called uh, Backyard Activists. And the Backyard Activist is run by a woman named Shannon Mann. She's a Canadian activist and environmentalist who worked with Paul Watson and Sea Shepherd for quite a long time. And the idea behind that is um, oftentimes people ask, after watching The Cove, to me, what can I do? How can I get involved? How can one person make a difference? And it's a daunting task 
for people when they're juggling all the rest of their lives. Um, the first thing you can do is add your name to any petition that you can make because they really do make a difference. You can also donate money if you can afford it, if you have the wherewithal to any of the organizations close to home or far away that are doing work other places. Backyard Activist encourages people. It's a wonderful organization that Shannon came up with where you go into the website, you fill out a profile of yourself, and the last thing you put in there is your zip code. And then the, the algorithm inside of the website matches you with people within 10 miles, 50 miles, and 100 miles mm -hmm. of your zip code that have similar interests that you do environmentally. Mm -hmm. So if you live in the Seattle, Tacoma area, and your interests are whales, the ocean, and environmentalism, then it'll pair you up with 20 other people that want to do something as well. And suddenly, instead of being alone out there on the corner with your sign or with your activism, you have an audience of people that are like-minded that you can participate with. So again, that's uh, Backyard Activists is the name of that organization. Oh, I didn't know about that. I think that's something that we're going to have to feature in the both college. That's really yeah. great. I'm all about people connecting around their uh, interests, whether it's their neighborhood.